bello, lo voy a dar la fuerza un jate. Ay, ni don la le de bello, lo voy a dar la fuerza un jate. Ay, ni don la le de bello, yo te lo voy a buscar, ni don lo voy a buscar, papá. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Leela Fernandez, director of the Jackson School of International Studies. Um, I'd like to welcome you to today's event. Um, let me begin by situating and locating the Jackson School. The Jackson School acknowledges that we are on Coast Salish territory, the traditional homelands of the Duwamish, Sequamish, Tulalip, Muckleshoot, and other Indigenous peoples. The Jackson School understands that the international community includes sovereign American Indian tribes, First Nations, and Indigenous peoples across the world. Um, welcome to today's event, which is part of our ongoing school uh, lecture series called Changing Global Connections, New Formations of Identity, Place, and Region. Uh, the series is sponsored by the Jackson School of International Studies and the Center for Global Studies. Additional Scott co-sponsors are the African Studies Program and Latin American and Caribbean Studies at the University of Washington. Um, I'd like to begin uh, today's program by introducing my colleague, Tony Lucero, who will um, introduce the speaker for today. To, uh, Tony Lucero is chair of the Latin American and Caribbean Studies Program, as well as the associate director of the Jackson School of International Studies. He's a scholar of indigenous politics, borderland studies, and social movements. In addition to being on the Jackson School faculty, he's also mem a member of the Comparative um, History of Ideas Department and on the advisory board of the Center for American Indian and Indigenous Studies. He also holds adjunct appointments in the Departments of American Indian Studies and Geography. His first book, Struggles of Voice, of Voice Indigenous Representations in the Andes, was an examination of the construction of indigenous movements in Bolivia and Ecuador. Uh, his forthcoming book is called What Side Are You On? Um, a Tohono O'otam, Life Across Borders. And it is a collaborative oral history project with Tohono O'otam tribal member, Mike Wilsip. And an another um, little known fact for those who are, who are not just scholars is Tony also happens to be one of the most conscientious uh, colleagues that I have and also happens to be an incredibly brilliant um, uh, teacher as, uh, as well. So with that, um, I'm delighted to uh, introduce you to Tony and Tony, I'll, I'll give it to you, over to you. Thank you, Leela, for that very warm and generous introduction. And also thank you for all the, the incredible work you do for, for our school and for our colleagues. Um, it's, a, it's, a really, it's a real pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Um, thank you also for that uh, wonderful uh, acknowledgement of where we are. Um, it's an important reminder that we're always on native lands, and um, that acknowledgement is a, a real opportunity for us to strive to reestablish right relations with the peoples, lands, and waters of this place. Uh, in light of the subject of today's talk, it's also worth noting that these lands from where I greet you all today, uh, Coast Salish lands, are also now home to many diasporic indigenous peoples, including Kanaka Maoli and other Pacific Islanders from across Oceania, and peoples from this hemisphere, uh, Avia Yala, which include Mixtec peoples, Zapotec, and Afro-Indigenous uh, Garifuna people as well, about whom we will learn much more in just a bit. 
so before I introduce our speaker, uh, who is himself a distinguished scholar of Garifuna and Hondureño descent, I wanted to give a special shout out to our friends at Garinago Hongua, an organization of Garifua community members who are very active here in the Seattle area. Uh, I, I know that some of them are listening tonight along with many friends and colleagues from across Turtle Island and beyond. And I know we're all very eager to hear from tonight's speaker. So it's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Paul Joseph Lopez Oro, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Africana Studies at Smith College. His research and teaching interests are on Black Latin American and US Black Latinx social movements, Black feminist and LGBTQ activism, political mobilizations, and Black queer feminist ethnographies in the Americas. His current manuscript, Indigenous Blackness in the Americas, The Queer Politics of Self-Making Garifuna, New York, is a transdisciplinary ethnography of how, on how gender and sexuality shaped the ways in which transgenerational Garifuna New Yorkers of Central American descent negotiate, perform, and articulate their multiple subjectivities as Black, Indigenous, and Afro-Latinx. His talk for today will focus on the second chapter of his book project, which is with uh, the chapter which is entitled Performing Indigenous Blackness, Ancestral Memory in the Garifuna Diaspora, in which he closely examines transgenerational activism of Garifunness, Garifunaness as an embodied archive as, uh, of ancestral memory in the multiple hemispheric spaces of Garifuna Settlement Day, as well as turning his Black Studies lens onto film and social media as US-born Garifuna folks engage hemispherically the curation of their own embodied archives of ancestrality vis-a-vis -vis public performance of Garifunaness. So without further ado, please join me in giving uh, Dr. Lopez Oro a very warm Zoom Welcome. Uh, Dr. Lopez Soto, the mic is yours. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, good afternoon, uh, everyone. Good evening here from Brooklyn, New York. Thank you for having me. Um, just a special shout out of gratitude and thanks to uh, Professor Lila Fernandez for the kind invitation to join you all today at the University of Washington. Um, as well as Jose Antonio Lucero, AKA you all know him as Tony for his generosity and moderation of today's talk. And most importantly to the phenomenal work of Monique Torman and Sarah Grin um, Grinberg for their incredible support and in just ensuring smooth Zoom logistics. And, and thank you for all who are here. Uh, there are 71 folks in this space and I'm so grateful for your presence. I'm incredibly excited to talk to you a little bit about the beginnings and the wonderings and the probings of the book. Um, before we go ahead, um, I wanna take a moment to recognize my presence on the territories of indigenous nations. As I join you all via Zoom from Brooklyn, New York, Lenape, Nakaye, Nayak, Canarsi, and, this, and those not recognized by the state of New York to bear witness to the long legacies of survival and resistance of the indigenous peoples of Turtle Island and throughout the Americas. My work could not be possible without a meditation on the impacts of settler colonialism, trans transatlantic slave trade, indigenous resistance, and on the legacies of what M. Jackie Alexander calls crossings, or rather our continually overlapping histories of dispossession. It is an honor and complete pleasure to share with you all the beginnings, the probings, the wonderings, and the thinkings on my first book manuscript, tentatively titled Indigenous Blackness in Ambas Americas, The Queer Politics of Self-Making Garifuna, New York. Garinagu, or Garifuna as they are probably popularly known, are Black Indigenous peoples whose ethnogenesis as descendants of shipwrecked and slave West Africans and Carib Arawak indigenous peoples on the Lesser Antillean island of St. Vincent, whose maroonage and resistance to enslavement and European colonialism marks their exile by British colonial powers in 1797 to the Bay Islands of Honduras, specifically Roatan, and subsequent migrations to mainland Central America's Caribbean coasts of Belize, Guatemala, Honduras, and Nicaragua prior to the formations of those republics, which is a significant silenced history of black indigeneity and the political and military formation of Central American nation states. Alongside giving us a deeper understanding of black indigenous history and life in an understudied and particular corner of the African diaspora, black Central America. Indigenous blackness in Ambas Americas, the queer politics of self-making Garifuna, New York 
is a transdisciplinary, transdisciplinary study on how Garifuna New Yorkers of Central American descent negotiate, perform, and articulate their multiple subjectivities at the intersections of their Blackness, of their indigeneity, and Afro-Latinidad throughout the Americas. New York City is home to the largest Garifuna community outside of Central America's Caribbean coast, which matters for a number of reasons, one of them pointing to the long histories of US imperialism on Central America's Caribbean coast vis-a-vis -vis the United Fruit Company, whose financial base were in Manhattan and New Orleans, another significant geography for Black Central Americans in the US. Here I'm thinking about the work of Glenn Chambers. I turn to multi-sided archives of public performances, oral histories, social media, film, documentaries, and print materials to piece together an often overlooked history of Black indigeneity in New York City. My subject position as a third generation Brooklyn Knight of Garifuna Honduran descent, born and raised on the nostalgia of my immigrant grandparents, parents, and siblings who returned me to the ancestral territories of El Triunfo de la Cruz, La Ceiba, and Dangriga, enough to settle a little Garifuna under my Spanglish tongue, informs my political and theoretical commitments to thinking and writing about Black indigeneity within a broader scope of the Americas. With careful attention to local and regional nuances, but always wondering Blackness, always understanding and contextualizing and framing Blackness and indigeneity to transcend geo-colonial hegemonic constructions of borders. To borrow from the work of the late Richard Eiton, my framing of diaspora as an anaformative impulse, putting all spaces into play with each other, dismantling and hopefully transcending nationalism or this stubborn thing we call the nation state. Standing on the theoretical and genealogical shoulders of Black queer feminist theories, theorists such as M. Jackie Alexander, Audre Lorde, Jafari Allen, and Omisheke and Natasha Tinsley, my queer reading of Garifuna and this throughout my book project centers a twofold praxis of resistance, as Tinsley writes, quote, queer not in the sense of a gay or same-sex loving identity waiting to be excavated from the ocean floor, but as a praxis of resistance, queer in the sense of marking disruption to the violence of normative order, and powerfully so, connecting in ways that commodified flesh was never supposed to, loving your own kind when your kind was supposed to cease to exist, forging interpersonal connections that counteract imperial desires for Africans living death." End of quote. Omashik and Natasha Tinsley breaks paths to help us to rethink how the Black Atlantic has always been the queer Atlantic, how the relationship between queerness and Blackness is always in the praxis of resistance to white supremacy, hegemony and commodifications and borders. My queer reading of Garifuna folks here and beyond is one that centers the silences and erasures of the political and cultural labor that LGBTQ plus identify Garifuna peoples who are, are at the forefront of political movements of preserving Garifuna culture. Garifuna culture, sorry. Garifuna culture, language and history are seen alongside how a queer reading of Garifunanis opens up the possibilities of zooming into a praxis of resisting hegemonic structures and institutions of compartmentalization, categorizations, and dislocations. So in the overarch of the work in indigenous blackness in ambas Americas, what I'm thinking through and what, what does it in, in kind of its simplest form, right? And, and I wanna share with you a bit of the, the kind of the skeleton before I zoom into chapter two, um, is to think simply about um, what does it mean to be Garifuna in the 21st century in New York City and throughout the Americas? How does the multiplicity of Garifuna Black indigeneity contest or disrupt notions of Blackness, indigeneity and Latinidad in the Americas? How do Garifuna folks mobilize politically, culturally, and diasporically to preserve their culture, language, and history in the company of African-Americans, Afro-Latinx, Caribbean, specifically thinking about West Indians, and continental Africans in the city of New York? And more importantly, what is it always already queer about Garifuna, right? And here I borrow from the works of E. Patrick Johnson, thinking through the work of Jafari Allen to think about what is the, the queerness already present in the articulations of Garifunanis in New York City? 
So with my, for my time with you all today, I wanna to share an excerpt from the second chapter, um, thinking about ancestral memory in the Garifuna diaspora, thinking about um, ancestral memory as an analytic of an embodied archive. I wanna just quickly also give you a bit of the skeleton in terms of where the book project currently stands. Um, it begins with the tragedy, one of the one of the deadliest fires in the city of New York, uh, Happy Land Social Club on March 25th, 1990, during David Dinkins' administration. So I pay really close attention to oral histories and the political mobilizations of remembering ancestors in this particular moment in Garifuna, New York, and also thinking through David Dinkins' um, leadership, right, and his activism around uh, getting Garifuna folks uh, visibly known in the city of New York alongside with other Black immigrant communities, right? So uh, during David Dinkins' uh, mayor, uh, mayoral administration, um, he not only has been the only African-American uh, mayor in the city of New York, but he's also been one of the most vocal uh, mayors of the city of New York uh, to push forward a civic and political agenda for Black immigrant communities, uh, which certainly helped with the visibility for Garifuna New Yorkers to be able to organize bilingual education programs to be to also organize cultural organizations, collective nonprofits where they were looking into community development through the lens of preserving uh, this indigenous black culture, language and history. So with that all being said, I'm going to turn over and talk to you a little bit about kind of zooming into chapter two, Performing Indigenous Blackness, Ancestral Memory in the Garifuna Diaspora. In this chapter, I use Garifuna Ancestral Memory as an analytic to closely examine how political imaginaries mobilize performances of an embodied archive, an act of conjuring the past into the present and future. Garifuna political imaginaries of ancestrality as embodied archives produce political subjectivities conjured by Garifuna women for Garifuna folks throughout their diasporas. I contend that the sacredness of memory is the manifestation of ancestral presence onto and through the flesh in the political imaginaries of Garifuna Settlement Day. So let me show you an image of Garifuna Settlement Day. I turn to the visual medium of film such as El Espíritu de Mi Mamá, and digital spaces such as Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. I'm interested in using Garifuna social memory as an analytic to closely observe how these political imaginations of Garifuna self-making their garifuna -ness as always already in diaspora, in arrival, right? Um, bounding their indigenous blackness to St. Vincent, to Central America's Caribbean coast, and more recently to the United States. How does ancestral memory politicize Garifuna folks in and out of Central America's Caribbean coast? And moreover, how does the conjuring invocation and reenacting of ancestral memory inform the political mobilization of Garifuna New Yorkers and their diaspora? So before um, I go and turn to situating a little bit around the importance of the history of Blackness and what, how is Blackness configured, uh, manifested in Central America, I'd love to show you um, what exactly the grief and the political imaginaries that I'm talking about um, is informing this ancestral memory. So give me one second, and I'm going to go ahead and share a video clip from the New York Times titled Being Garifuna. Um, and, you know, while we, while we kind of open up the space and think about this clip, um, love for you to pay close attention to the manifestations of political mobilization and ancestral memory working hand in hand. People just automatically think I'm black. I mean, they say it, they're like, oh, but you look black. I'm like, okay, yeah. But it's more to it, it's more to who I am. On a Sunday afternoon last spring, several hundred people, mostly of Honduran descent, gathered in a school auditorium in the Bronx for the Miss Getty Funa beauty pageant. The girls, they wear the, the outfits that the, the women from the Garifuna village used to wear. 
when they perform, they're picking dances from Caribbean people used to do in Honduras. They're sugar-coated, they're not adding anything modern to it, it's just the culture. The Garifunas are part African, part Caribbean, and part Central American. They descend from the native Arawaks of the Caribbean island of St. Vincent, and also from a group of West African slaves who landed there in 1797. In recent decades, many have immigrated to New York City. New York is the largest Garifuna community outside of Central America. There are guesstimates that there are 200,000 Garifunas in all the five boroughs. But when it comes to being counted in the census, the Garifunas say they don't fit into any box. Increasingly, there is a disconnect between how different ethnic and racial groups identify and how the census wants to count them. In the 2010 census, more than 18 million Latinos rejected the standard race categories, instead picking the catch-all known as some other race. Many argue, like 22-year-old Dilma Suazo, that they are so racially mixed that they constitute their own race. Yeah. Okay, I'm good. Garifuna, to me, is who I am. It's my culture, it's my language, it's my food, it's literally my family. In the lead-up to the 2010 census, Dilma and others in her family selected other race and wrote in Garifuna. Everybody did it. My aunt did it. My mom did it. So hopefully, it, maybe in the long run, maybe in a couple of years, it will be that box that would say Garifuna. We no longer have to check other and have to write in Garifuna. Who's the cook? Ooh, everybody! Oh, everybody. <laughs> Dilma's family gathered at her grandmother's apartment in East New York, Brooklyn, for traditional dinner, <laughs> dancing, <laughs> In conversation. Usually, like if I had to check off a box, I would put um, as my race or how I would identify myself as Latina. I would never put Garifuna or other, check other, until current, currently I put other now. But I didn't know if it was valid, if Garifuna was valid to put, like if they would understand where that came from. You see diversity with Asians and Puerto Ricans and Dominicans. You, you grow up looking at their culture and then you, you realize, okay, that's their culture. But what about mine? Oh, if you want to go colored wise, sure, I can say I'm black. Do we want to go language wise? Sure, I can say I'm Hispanic. Technically, it's brown skin. But, but I mean, yeah, seriously. So that way, we're, now you're here, and we're like, okay, you got all this other Czech stuff. And so we called it, we like, you know what? We're going to go to other and just put Garifuna. for now. The Census Bureau acknowledges there's a problem with the questions of race and ethnicity. In 2010, they tested different wording in the forms. And last year, they held focus groups with a report expected this summer. <laughs> so before turning to an analysis on the performance of Getty for Ancestral Memory, I think it'd be really important to kind of situate the histories of anti-Black racism on Central America's Caribbean coast, paying close attention to the ways in which those histories and present day realities shape how Garifuna New Yorkers in diaspora and on the isthmus politically mobilized to preserve and restore their culture, language, and history in the face of mestizo multiculturalism. In the United States, the invocation of Central America conjures a set of racial and political imaginaries that center mestizos, indigenous cultures, revolutionary movements, civil wars, and US occupations. That at times eclipsed a discussion of race and racism in the region and its diasporas. So when you have these moments that CNN, MSNBC are talking about the US-Mexico border crisis and they center Central Americans, um, rarely and quite literally, do you never see Black Central Americans crossing the U.S.-Mexico border, right? So if you were to tune into the news headline and to the footage, you would assume there are no Black people leaving Central America. In Central America, race and racism is obscured by the ghosts of mestizaje as an imagined racial mixture birthing a mythical racial sameness bounded by nationalism. Within Central American mestizaje, Blackness is relegated, alienated, and ascribed to the Caribbean coast, erasing centuries of Black folks in the interior and Pacific coast. By ascribing Blackness and Black people to Central America's Caribbean coast, mestizaje constructs its imaginary in opposition to and in negation of Blackness. 
especially when the Caribbean coast is understood to, remove, to be removed from the national political spaces of mestizo governance, i.e. Managua or Tegucigalpa. So uh, the Caribbean coast in Central America becomes the only sole marker of blackness and that blackness is coming from somewhere else, right? That blackness is not um, foundational to the formation of national identity, right? So there isn't this kind of uh, typical mixture that you hear throughout Latin America, right? Of mestizaje being about European, indigenous and African mixture, right? So the mixture, the kind of racialized mixture around mestizaje in Central America entirely negates uh, African peoples, right? It entirely get, negates African culture and African history in the region and makes Blackness alien to Central America, right? Um, it also makes Blackness as something that is coming from the exterior, right? The exterior of the nation state instead of being foundational to the formation of the nation state. So moreover, it renders and ascribes Central American Blackness as Caribbean coming from elsewhere, not already always present prior to the formation of the Republic. More recently, Central American neoliberal multiculturalism constructs Blackness as a folkloric caricature for tourist and popular culture consumption. Therefore, Black Central Americans doubly negotiate their invisibilities on the Ismans and in their diasporas in the United States. Despite, despite the extensive and rich history of Africans and their descendants in the Ismans, Ismus, especially their presence and contributions centuries prior to the 1821 wars of independence, black history and blackness remains aliens to Central American nationhood in and outside of the Isthmus. This negation and erasure of black folks is produced and preserved by the dominant nationalist racial project of mestizaje. Black Central Americans transgenerationally migrate to the United States with centuries of embodied histories of anti-Black racism and violence. And my reference to violence here is one both physical and epistemological, pointing to the centuries of land dispossession, US imperialism, US imperialism and erasure from national subjecthood. And these histories don't kind of just leave in a vacuum, right? So one of the things that I, I, I always feel that is in, entirely and really foundationally important is to, to not only pinpoint how Central American mestizaje as an anti-Black project um, and to a certain extent an anti-Indigenous project. So here I'm building on the work of Juliet Hooker, whose uh, foundational essay, Indigenous Inclusion, Black Exclusion, right, Multiculturalism in Latin America, uh, there's certainly not an even level playing field, right, when it comes to uh, Black civil rights and human rights in Latin America. There is certainly a precedence to center indigenous communities, right, in ways that actually um, make Black communities in not only in this kind of really complicated negotiation and competition with indigenous communities, but there needs to be an articulation of Black communities as, as having some type of culture, right? So when, when the society, what, what Misty Sahe kind of creates in, not kind of creates, what it creates in Latin America, in particular in Central America, it creates the illusion that racism doesn't exist, right? That Central America is not a racist place, it's a classist space, right? That this is the, the, um, the inequities, the, the discriminations, the prejudices, uh, is all built on the notion of class, right? That in fact, um, it is the majority of the peoples who are working poor and then the very kind of top elite. Well, what happens in that narrative is that we, we tend to erase uh, the persistentness of anti-Blackness in the region and how anti-Blackness creates these conditions and actually is the propeller of the US-Mexico border crisis, right? That it's in fact, not simply just US imperialism that is kind of external, but is also the, the perpetual persistentness of anti-Black racism in the region, in the nation state that only actually creates this image, right? So this is what Mestizaje in kind of um, building on the work of Charlie Hale, thinking through around neoliberal multiculturalism is that it creates these caricatures to the nation state. It creates these moments of folklore, of tourist attraction, um, while on the same land that Garifuna folks um, not only have gained rights from the late 80s and the early um, 90s, but also um, they're being dispossessed violently. Right, these are Garifuna lands are being sold to foreign capital, and the Honduran nation state is quite literally um, 
dispossessing folks from their homes, right? Um, but yet, here's this notion of come to come to the Caribbean coast of Honduras, right? This is what you'll get in the beach. This is what you'll get. This is the music. This is the culture. This is the food, right? Um, so thinking about how uh, Black culture is always commodified, right? Um, especially in the afterlife of slavery. And I'll, I'm happy to talk a little bit more about that in the Q&A. So borders are contentious spaces where the fiction of the nation state meets its geographical limits. Created through European, European imperial and settler colonial violence, the fictiveness of borders across the Americas are well rehearsed, while their material necessity is bemoaned by those racially belong and face the racialized regulatory impulse of the nation state. So the project of building a modern nation state with an imagined homogeneous racially mixed community is rooted in the gendered and racialized violence of anti-blackness and anti-indigeneity, as in the attendant project of multicultural celebrations of black and indigenous cultures. So in Central America, blackness and geography are in, in, intrinsically entangled with histories of Spanish colonialism, British colonialism, mestizo governance, and alienation of blackness to the Atlantic coast, right? So it's really important, right, to also think about how mestizaje as a racial discourse emerges at the early 20th century in response to a larger hemispheric critique of US imperialism grounding Latin America's myth of racial democracy as a distinct marker of race, uh, of racial sameness in the face of US Jim Crow apartheid. Right, so this is also, you know, mestizaje is also this kind of um, hemispheric impulse in response to what's happening in the global north, right? And uh, Latin American nation states uses the use this Jim Crow, right? And thinking of, specifically thinking about the work of again, uh, Glenn Chambers and Juliet Hooker to think about this kind of hemispheric framing around mestizaje, um, because Jim Crow certainly informs the ways in which mestizaje becomes a viable project, right? Uh, so for Central America. American ideologies of mestizaje, they emerge in distinct, in distinct geographies and historical moments. Um, in the case of Honduras, they emerge at a time of United Fruit Company presence. They also emerge at a time where there's anti-Black immigrant laws, specifically um, West Indian laborers uh, coming from Antigua, coming from Jamaica, coming from Barbados, uh, particularly once the United Fruit Company uh, disbands. So to, to kind of pay close attention, I, I, I want to turn now to a little bit around uh, Garifuna Settlement Day. And I, I want us to think about how does Garifuna Settlement Day not only disrupts uh, mestizaje, disrupts anti-Black racism, um, but it informs the political mobilization and self-making processes of Garifuna New Yorkers. And I think these histories and, and, and what I'm thinking through in this particular chapter is these histories are embedded memories that are transmis transmitted generationally through oral histories. And it really informs the ways in which Garifuna New Yorkers are negotiating, articulating their blackness, their indigeneity and Central Americanness, right? And once again, in, in kind of the framing of Lada Putnam's work, right? Thinking about how they're making all of these negotiations in the company of other black diaspora communities, right? And it's important to also think about African-Americans as always already diasporic, right? Um, even though there's a particular kind of certain project around US nationalism that is um, there, right? But we also have to think about how African Americans in particular are also shaping the ways in which Garifuna New Yorkers are thinking about their own Blackness in the company of, right? So this is the moment where I'm also going to turn um, in other chapters on looking at the specific history of Garifuna New Yorkers attending um, HBCUs um, on the East Coast. So thinking specifically about Howard University. Um, Howard University um, has one of the first Afro-Latinx student organizations called Cimarrones, which translates to Maroons. Um, and it's an organization that got started by a grief and a Guatemalan woman from the Bronx and a Panamanian woman from Colón and Brooklyn, right? So um, thinking about historically Black colleges and universities as uh, sites of hemispheric Blackness um, and as well as sites for Garifuna New Yorkers uh, to build, right, um, not only their mobility in the US, but to also build on hemispheric Blackness. 
So grief on a settlement date, let me contextualize what it is, talk to you a little bit about that, and then I'll turn to the film and try to wrap up with social media. So ancestral memory is conjured, performed, and reenacted in multiple spaces and times in the Garifuna diaspora. Garifuna folks, as early uh, as previously mentioned, are descendants of shipwrecked enslaved West Africans and Carib Arawak Indians on the Lesser Antillean Island of St. Vincent. I go back to this ethnogenesis a lot, um, particularly because it's an ethnogenesis that really shapes Garifuna political imaginaries, um, certainly the distancing to plantation life, to enslavement in the Americas, but certainly making St. Vincent an ancestral homeland, right? And by marking St. Vincent as an ancestral homeland, it allows for Garifuna political subjectivities to also be bounded and rebounded, right? So thinking about um, the, the multiplicity of Garifuna political subjectivities, one grounded in, in the West Indies of the Caribbean, right? Um, and then one grounded um, on, uh, on Central America's Caribbean coast that continues to live in the afterlife of Spanish and British colonialism. And then to also think about, well, what does all of those multiplicities mean in, a city of, in the city of New York, right? What does it mean to put those um, multiple borders, geographies, and conversation into a, an, into a city where Garifuna folks are certainly interpolated, read as African-American, as Caribbean, as Central American, um, and to a certain extent, Afro-Latinx. And I'm happy to also talk about kind of the contemporary rejections of Afro-Latinidad, um, which is certainly chapter four of the book, but happy to talk about, well, what does it mean when Garifuna folks are rejecting Afro-Latinidad um, in lieu of their garifuna right? In lieu of marking their garifuna as something that um, needs to be named and needs to be acknowledged. So thinking about reenactment here, um, I place a big attention to the script, right? What is the script that the body is telling us? So Garifuna Settlement Day reenacts and remembers this ancestral arrival to Central America's Caribbean coast as one of exile, as one of maroonage, um, as one as a history of cultural survival, right? And St. Vincent being a site of Garifuna ethnogenesis, a Caribbean homeland, really complicates this arrival, right? So this arrival gets reenacted yearly. There's different dates for it. Belize was the first Central American nation state to have a Garifuna settlement day, in particular because of the moment that they were living in, right? So Belize is the last nation state in Central America to get independent from European colonizers. Um, so it's a very young nation state. And it, at a time, right, in the late 80s, um, Nicaragua modeled for the rest of Latin America, what, is, what does it mean to think about no longer being a mestizo country, but to think about the constitution made by multicultural communities, right? So multiculturalism really becomes the ways in which Black and Indigenous communities are fighting for collective rights by the state. Right, so this is kind of the 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 shift from mestizaje to multiculturalism. Um, I contend in my work that multiculturalism is a continuation of mestizaje. It's mestizaje 2.0, and I'm happy to talk more about that. I know that um, folks adore multiculturalism, right? I think it's kind of this utopian liberal mindset. Um, but what, what what's really disturbing about multiculturalism is that multiculturalism actually does not produce viable political representation for black life, right? So in the context of Latin America and the context of Central America, uh, to be to, to live in a multicultural constitution, a multicultural space, it, it means for Garifuna folks that they become caricatures of what the state imagines Garifuna culture to be, right? Uh, this image, this postcard, this tourist marker doesn't tell you uh, the close to 300 years of not only uh, presence that Garifuna folks have had in Central America in their uh, both political, military, economic contributions to the nation state, but it also tells you the fixity of geography of where Garifuna folks are located, right? So it, it, it entirely erases and dismantles uh, where Garifuna communities can possibly be, right? You won't think of Garifuna folks in La Ciudad de Guatemala, right? You don't think of Garifuna and other Black Indigenous communities living in the center capitals, right? Um, these are not spaces where we think about, right, where, where Blackness is, is located easily 
in Central America's national imaginary. So it's important to also think about, to complicate what exactly multiculturalism actually has done for Black and Indigenous life in, in Latin America. Um, so here, when I think about memory and when I think about ancestral memory, um, I'm certainly in conversation uh, with Toni Morrison's notion of the interior, right? So thinking about um, what, what are kind of the deep memories that are passed on generationally, thinking about also Zora Neale Hurston's turn to memory and how memory is certainly something that one has to deeply, deeply build into interiorly, um, which makes me really think about R.G. Lord's, uh, Lord's use of the erotic um, in terms as deep forms of knowledge, right? Um, and I want to think about ancestral memories as embedded in our flesh, memories that are conjured in everyday lives through words, sounds, fragrances, prayers, dreams, sights, and so much more. Memories are fragments of our past making a new home in the present. Throughout the African diaspora, memories and the acts of remembering our political, ancestral, cultural, communal, and spiritual practices of surviving, preserving, and producing histories. Historically and presently, Garifuna are part of three distinct diasporas, the African diaspora, so read the, uh, the, the enslavement of the Middle Passage and the Maroonness in the Americas, the Caribbean, the Caribbean diaspora, right? So St. Vincent as a collectively articulated ancestral home in the Central American diaspora, right? So the ways of migrations from south of the US border dating back to the 1880s to the present, despite the erasure of Black peoples and those histories of Latin Americans of Latin American transmigrations, right? So it's, once again, it's really important to, to go back to how um, Black, Black Central Americans, Black people in Latin America are read out of this kind of uh, Latin American migration to the US, right? That in fact, um, Blackness is, uh, gets to be gets to be framed and constructed to, to solely the Caribbean, right? So thinking about when we think about Latin American migration, there's an emphasis, particularly Central American migration, to think about those migrants um, being brown and only brown, right? And a certain kind of brown that alludes to indigeneity, a certain kind of brown that alludes to mestizaje, to mestizoness, right? Um, that it's important to kind of reiterate that, particularly because the, one of the realities that continues to shape Garifuna diasporas into the U.S. is that there are more Garifuna folks living in the U.S., right? Uh, this is not a community that has just recently arrived, despite of certain narratives that are being constructed, right, within the fields of sociology or anthropology. Um, this is a community that has been bounded by U.S. imperialism, that has a deep connection to the U.S. South, right? So thinking about uh, New Orleans, thinking about Atlanta, thinking about Houston, uh, these are not new sites that Garifuna folks have entered into those geographies. Those are uh, decades and decades long of transgenerational migrations. Um, and it is also deeply important to note that Garifuna Central Americans have been in New York City since the 50s, right? So not only um, does that tell you in terms of the length of the time of where you New York, but it should also point to you and tell you and inform you about also the histories of Garifuna New Yorkers in larger, broader movements of the civil rights movement, uh, broader movements of the young lords, right? So thinking about how even within the context of Black New York and Latinx New York, how Garifuna folks find themselves um, in both spaces, right? And in both of those spaces negotiating uh, activism and politicizing um, around Black rights and Black life. So Garifa and Settlement Day is fertile grounds for thinking about how Garifuna politically mobilizes vis-a-vis -vis performance of arrival, exile, and territory through an embodied archive of ancestral memory. Garifuna Settlement Day is a public act of remembering the enactment of performance space to embody ancestral memory and believes November 19th 
1823 is recognized as the date of arrival, of ancestral arrival of the Gari Naguta Dangriga, the largest Garifuna community in Belize. The very first Garifuna Settlement Day celebration in the Americas takes place on November 19th, 1941 in Dangriga, Belize as a political project of remembrance and ethno-racial recognition in the face of land encroachment and anti-Black racism 40 years to Brazil's, prior to Brazil's formerly British Honduras whose independence was on September 21st, uh, 1981. In the present day, Garifuna Settlement Day is commemorated throughout the Americas, especially within Garifuna diasporas in the US. So thinking about moments of Garifuna Settlement Day in Brooklyn, in the South Bronx, um, as well as City Hall in downtown Manhattan, the political project of Garifuna cultural preservation here emerges at a specific historical conjecture, right? So thinking about the context of Belize, there's a certain kind of emergence of organizing around Creole communities with West Indian communities, with other indigenous communities, specifically thinking about the Mesquitu communities alongside, um, you know, one of the things about where we from the settlement day, it becomes a site that allows for political recognition, visibility, right? There's a, there's a political impulse, there's an intellectual impulse around the project of visibility that Garifuna folks engage with. And it's important to really mark that as, as a political strategy, right? Um, despite its limitations, the visibility that Garifuna folks have been working um, in for decades now um, to having uh, recognition both by the Central American nation state as well as having recognition uh, by the US, right? So this is where kind of the history of Garifuna in New York is really cement, really foundational to the rest of Garifuna folks in the US, right? It really models um, for the rest of the United States, well, what does it mean for Garifuna, Garifuna folks in the US to still want to claim their Garifuna-ness, right? Still want to claim their Blackness, their indigeneity, and their Central Americanness in ways that don't necessarily complicate uh, the, the five major categories, right? The five big census categories, but queerly um, really allows us to think about how do Garifuna folks queerly actually navigate that space and queerly become othered, right? And find themselves othering um, with the intention of bringing visibility, right? That in fact, the space of othering themselves into the category of other, into the writing and scripting of Garifuna allows for the possibilities of recognition, right? And I'm, I'm, I'm in a place where I'm happy to talk about the limits of recognition and I'm also happy to talk about, um, well, what exactly does the recognition bring forward, right? And I'm, what I'm actually really interested in this chapter is to really think about, well, the recognition brings forward ancestral memory and how do we, how do we, you know, ancestral memory in the sense of what does it mean to also think about a Black archive, a Black Indigenous archive in this context that is not readily available in institutions, right? So at the beginning of this dissertation project, my impulse was to run to the Schomburg. Right, it was to run to the corner of 135th and Lenox. Right, um, I'm doing a dissertation project on Garifuna, New York. I know for a fact Garifuna, New York, New Yorkers have been in New York since the 1950s. I go to the Schomburg with hopes that I'm just gonna walk into just endless rooms of like Garifuna material. And what actually ends up happening is that there's very little archival information around Garifuna folks in New York. And I start digging into uh, West Indian archives. I start digging into when West Indian New York archives, right, in the Schomburg. And I find little moments of, OK, Garifuna folks, Black Caribs, right, which was the prior name and, and kind of pinning it together. Um, but when the Schomburg and other archives um, institutionally are just you know, to kind of borrow from the city of Hartman's, right? Thinking of a death tomb, right? Um, and, and kind of thinking about also the afterlife of slavery and how that shapes the archive. Um, I had no other choice but to turn to the public spaces, right? To turn to the public performances um, and, and certainly allow for that, um, 
disruption for my own self, right? Because walking into the project, there was already this assumption of, well, an archive is this, right? And if, if I can't find the archive, um, the people, right? The people are the living archive. And it was really important to really turn to the performances of Garif and Osetto Mende um, and the nuances, right? The nuances of the performances and the regional differences of performances. But what's so central here throughout the diaspora is that the performance of ancestral arrival is the same, right? That even though there are differences in the performances, there are recollections, uh, recollections, the remembrances, the songs are really different. Um, the what what's really central to, um, in particular, to the notion of ancestral arrival is the actual act of revival, right? And the actual act of ancestral revival as one of survival, right? And one as transgenerational preservation, right? And what, is, what does it mean to also perform Garifonanes to future generations of Garifuna folks, right? Who are not only geographically removed from Central America's Caribbean coast, but are also um, very much reimagining and re-articulating what Garifunanis looks like in their own communities, in their own homes, and in, in their own subjectivities. So um, as a way of closing, I'd love to turn over to El Espiritu de Mi Mama um, and talk a little bit about this film that really um, cements for me a lot of the conjuring that I'm talking about um, and, and want to talk to you a little bit about Garifuna matrilinealness uh, Garifuna feminism, right? Um, but also Garifuna spirituality in the sense where um, ancestral memory does not happen, right? Um, in a vacuum, it's a collective, it's a community, it's uh, a calling out, right? Um, that is that is led by Garifuna women, right? And this is this is the the, the incredibly important part of the matrilineal um, aspect is that the matrilineal Garifuna women are the, the foundation to Garifuna ancestrality and Garifuna spirituality, right? So Garifuna women uh, conjure spirits, uh, Garifuna women conjure the space and the geography to allow for the ancestors to be present. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about El Espirito de Mi Mama and then close with uh, just the social media presence of Garifuna Ness. So there, out in the world, there's an array of documentaries and video clips on grief and history and culture. Yet there are a few of those that have been produced by and for grief and communities. So in El Espirito de Mi Mamá, the Spirit of My Mother is one of the first films written, produced, and directed by and for Garifuna folks. In 1999, this film made its debut in a community-based Garifuna language school in East Los Angeles. It centers the, the journey of Sonia Martinez, a young Garifuna woman, single mother, domestic worker, immigrant from Sambo Creek, Honduras, who has recently lost her mother and was not able to return to Honduras to bury her due to financial restrictions. The film opens up with the sounds of waves crushing rapidly following the rhythm of a low segunda drum. A low segunda drum plays a sonic role in quietly opening the space for ancestral presence. It is calm like a deep breath, but steadily rapid as waves crashing into the shore. We enter into Sonia's dream, where her mother spirit is pleading for an offering as she stands in front of the Atlantic Ocean dressed in all white saying, Sonia, hija mía, Necesito algo de ti. Tengo hambre, tengo sed. Necesito vestirme de otra forma porque mucho tiempo he estado con esta ropa blanca. Necesito que me ayudes. Necesito comida. Necesito agua. Necesito bañarme. Necesito bañarme. Necesito bañarme. Sonia's mother's plea for an ancestral offering invokes an important tradition of ancestral remembrance and spirituality. The good is an offering to have the spirit of the deceased family member be satisfied, to be rested, to be given strength to continue the labor of protecting and guiding the living. The goods are communal, led by Garifuna women elders, who are the only ones who can do them. Garifuna men are the drummers who bring the ancestral spirits into the living space, but Garifuna women are the ones who communicate information, knowledge, and embodied possession. So I'm gonna show a very brief clip um, from El Espiritu de Mi Mamá. In this clip, we see uh, 
the transgenerational, the intergenerational Garifuna uh, matrilineal kinship that is built through spirituality. So I wanna be able to show you that clip. Uh, so this is Sonia um, coming back to her, 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 her hometown of Sambo Creek. Um, she's coming to look for her mom's sister, right? And this is Sonia kind of reconnecting with her aunt. Ya hace tres años ya. Vamos a ver qué podemos hacer por ti. Porque tú sabes que entre raza nosotros, no raza garífona, cuando uno sueña con esas cosas, es el espíritu que te anda buscando. Eh, yo conozco una señora que sabe de esas cosas, que se le, le dice en Buyey. Te voy a llevar a donde ella a ver qué dice la señora. ¿Cuándo podemos visitarla a ella? Podemos ir mañana a visitar a esa señora, a ver qué dice. So I'm going to go ahead and, and pause it there. Um, one of the things about the, ri the richness of that clip, right? And I think what I, um, I'm constantly gravitating towards in that clip is, is certainly not, certainly the, the Garifuna matrilineal kinship and spirituality that's certainly present, right? Um, but the, the, the intimacy of grief and the spirituality, right? That even Sonia doesn't get to fully experience herself, right? And, and this is in, incredibly important too when we think about uh, U.S. Garifuna folks, right, and this notion of loss of culture or notion of loss of traditions um, is, is the, the, the limitations to access to that. And I think um, certainly is one that is generational, right? 
Um, and particularly when we think about uh, Garifuna elders, right, Garifuna women elders, uh, to, think, to, to think about that, that labor that we just witnessed as, as political labor, right, uh, as political, intellectual, spiritual labor that really contributes to a hemispheric notion of indigenous Blackness. Uh, so this is an incredibly uh, rich film. It's one of the first films that you kind of see Garifuna culture without this anthropological gaze Right, so there's this kind of there's a tendency on Garifuna filming, and I would even argue for a lot of right um, indigenous Black communities, there's this anthropological gaze that Garifuna folks get constrived and, and ascribed to and bounded to, right? Um, but this is one of the first films that really highlights um, Garifuna diaspora in the U.S. Right, Sonia is living in Los Angeles, California, which really also disrupts, right? Uh, the racialized geographies of where Garifuna folks in the U.S. are located. Um, California, Los Angeles in particular, um, has one of the largest Garifuna Belizean communities. Uh, Sonia is Garifuna and Honduran, a Spanish speaker, right? So it really kind of disrupts notions of what Latinidad could be on the West Coast, right? Um, so that's one aspect that I find the film uh, doing a lot of work. So just by way of conclusion uh, on this chapter, I, I, I close the chapter with social media. Um, I wanted to turn to social media uh, as a potential site of, um, of archiving as curating Garifuna Life, Garifuna Twitter, um, which really certainly disrupts uh, kind of this uh, Central American uh, Twitter, uh, which is certainly mestizo focused, but there's certainly something about, um, I'm calling it right now and I'm bookmarking it this, um, the, the Arturo Alfonso Schomburg impulse, right? So Arturo Alfonso Schomburg is a black man who is born in Puerto Rico, is told in Puerto Rico that black people have no history and quite literally devoted uh, the rest of his political, intellectual, spiritual life to literally uh, archiving, collecting, disseminating, um, and more importantly, institutionally building um, archives of black life and black culture, right? Um, to this day, we have one of the most important black archives in the world, I would even argue, named after him, right? So what does it mean for grief and folks to do the similar kind of political labor in the social media space? And there's a certain disruption, right, that grief and folks are doing in, in the world of social media. Uh, there's a disruption to the kind of mestizo fixity on Central Americans and Central American culture, right? Um, but there's also this kind of um, really fascinating uh, hemispheric, um, dialogue that's happening in a way that isn't necessarily bounded to nation states, right? That isn't necessarily bounded to, even though Twitter is a place where you can, you know, create a handle or create a name or create a hashtag or create your image. And, and it could be Belizean, it could be Guatemalan, it could be Nicaraguan, it could be Honduran. But there's something about Garifuna Twitter that allows for a certain kind of centering and archiving of, of Garifuna life, right? That isn't commodified, that isn't a fetish, that isn't, that doesn't just get celebrated on Garifuna Settlement Day, right? That um, there's uh, accounts like Gar the Garifuna Market, right? Uh, thinking about the labor of someone like Janelle Martinez, who I'm constantly blown away by, um, you know, and I'd, I'd love to finish up with her as well as I would, um, Arnold, Arnold Martinez, right? Uh, creating spaces where uh, he uses Garifuna dance as a source of cardio workouts, right? And there's classes where you can work out and learn about Garifuna culture and Garifuna dance and, and, the, and the importance of Garifuna movement, right? As one that is spiritual, um, but one that's informed by an identity that's indigenous and black, right? Um, so to think about these spaces that are being carved out um, in, digital, in digital social media world is really helpful to think about how Garifuna folks are self-making their garifuna -ness in New York City and throughout the Americas. Thank you everyone for your time. I really appreciate it. That, that was terrific, uh, Pablo. Thank you so much. That was a wonderful talk. Um, we're, uh, we have time for questions. We've got about half an hour or so, and many of you have already found the Q&A uh, button down at the bottom of the screen. 
Um, so what I'll do, uh, uh, Dr. Lopez Oro, is I'll, uh, I'll, I'll curate uh, from here uh, and maybe take a few at a time so we can maximize uh, audience participation. So there's a, there's a really interesting question about the census. Uh, the questioner asks that the census is more about identification, yet so much of your wonderful talk seems to suggest a liminal space for Garifuna. Have you worked with the idea of disidentification? Does that change the dynamic of recognition? Um, a follow-up question is, your work on memory and flesh and on spirituality unsettles our understanding of knowledge in such important ways. Could you reflect on that and how that space, um, how that shapes uh, how you approach your own writing and knowledge production? And let me piggyback on that last question just to round off the first round of questions to ask about the centrality of the arts, because one of the things that seems striking about your this chapter especially is about the importance of the of the publicness of the of this and the performance and you know, our colleague here in Seattle, Monica Rojas, and her work with Movimiento Afro-Latino Seattle, it's really through the arts that is such a, a space mm -hmm. for, for this kind of community building. So I'm, I'm wondering if that, you know, to borrow from Diana Taylor, if it's the repertoire more than the archive that is really central for, for this, not only in New York, but across the, the Garifuna diaspora. So let's, let's leave it there for that first round, I'll let you respond. Yeah, no, definitely. Thank you for the questions. Um, I'm especially interested in the census question because I think the the census question is um, incredibly complicated. Um, I think the census is a very flawed document, um, but it's a, it's a document that brings so much needed federal representation in terms of funding and resources, um, which becomes a site of contention, right? Which becomes a site of needing to bring um, you know, quote unquote, an authentic representation of one's racial and ethnic marker. Um, I think here in particular, the notion of, there's something about othering and writing, you know, checking other and writing in Garifuna that I find incredibly promising um, and fascinating, but also very queer, right? Um, in the sense of what is it, why don't Garifuna folks just check off Black and Native American? Right? What is it about Garifunaness that folks are still holding on to? Right? And I think the project of Garifunaness is one about an ethno racial nationalism project, right? A project that really um, highlights um, Garifuna folks' indigeneity through a lens of Blackness, right? Um, and that's a really complicated statement because there's been a lot of clear examples of where um, Garifuna folks are certainly very well versed in knowing how to choreograph those negotiations around their own indigeneity. Um, for Garifuna folks, indigeneity has to be performed, it has to be invoked, it has to be named. It's not one that depends on a centralized phenotype. So I'm actually really interested throughout the whole book asking questions around, well, what does it mean to think about uh, Black folks throughout the Americas, right, um, from the highest tip of Canada to the lowest tip of Argentina as Indigenous to the Americas, right? And how do Garifuna folks, who are not the only Black Indigenous peoples in the Americas, right? We have to think about uh, the Jamaican Maroons. We have to think about Palenque in Colombia, the Quilombos in Brazil, uh, the Seminoles in the U.S. South, the Gullah and the Quiche folk in the Carolinas, right? To think about how other um, Indigenous Black communities have been uh, giving us examples of how to dis disrupt this compartmentalization, right? Um, and I'm also interested in like, how do Garifuna folks use beyond notions of land, right? The physicality of land, right? As a marker of indigeneity, right? And actually use, right? The notion of shipwreck slaves as their marker of being indigenous to the Americas, right? As one, as, as to kind of reimagine the Black Atlantic as the groundings of indigeneity for peoples of African descent in the Americas, right? And I think the census doesn't get us to that point, but I think the performances around ancestral arrival, the performances that, sim that easily look like projects of visibility are telling us more complicated and nuances about land making, identities, right? Um, and, and certainly land making identities that are in the hemispheric dialogue. Um, and that second question, Tony, you were looking at, you spoke- about, about knowledge production, how you're thinking about how, how this um, 
affects your understanding of knowledge production. And I was asking also about the centrality of the arts in, in thinking about this as a, as a form of understanding. Yeah, so knowledge production, I mean, I think I one of the big, big reasons I turned to ancestral memory as an embodied archive is because I seriously take the work that Garifuna women are doing in the public spaces of remembering the dead, of the, the, the ceremonies of the Dagu or the, the conjuring of the performances for Garifuna Settlement Day as knowledge production, right? I see those movements, those um, expressions, those lived experiences as knowledge productions when an archive isn't institutionalized, right? So I think there's, you know, I go back to this moment of the Schomburg quite literally not having enough materials to write a dissertation on Garifuna, New York, right? And what does it mean to take seriously the embodied work of Garifuna women's labor of being it spiritual, being it political, being intellectual as knowledge producers, right? So this is where um, in the chapter, I really turn to Garifuna women elders um, who are doing the songs of ancestral revival from Udomain, right? Udomain being the Garifuna word for St. Vincent and how St. Vincent um, is reperformed, reenacted, not solely as the ancestral homeland, but as the site where also one is calling on to the ancestors to come to the present, right? And how art in particular, you know, I don't, not that I don't pay attention to art, but I do, um, you know, art comes up through the visual cultures of the actual re reenactment, right? So there's certain attires, there's certain, uh, you know, so like to even see this, right? To even, even the opening image to today, I mean, this is, this is a Misa, right? This is a Misa in Orchard Beach to the ancestors, right? Um, so even though this, I wouldn't, you know, I don't think folks would be like, this is traditional art, right? But to think about how um, the, the adornment, the attire, the fashioning, the drumming, right? Brings into this space all of the, all of what is needed for the stage of, of Garifuna and ancestral memory to be embodied, to be, to be present. Okay, that's fantastic. The, the questions are pouring in, so I'm going to try to do my best to group a couple more for you. Um, and they're very rich. Let me, um, let me turn to a question from our colleague, Latasha Levy, uh, who I know is a friend of yours as well. She says, such a beautiful and rich project. Thank you for sharing. I learned so much today. I'm curious about how you define race in your project. The clip in which Garifuna folks explain why they didn't mark black on the census, they describe race as color, food, culture. While the disruption of these categories on the census is compelling, I'm wondering if there's also a form of anti-Blackness operating there. Particularly, some may prefer to mark themselves as Latino, Latina. It seems the way race operates as a power relationship is not about cultural language or color. Are folks understanding Black as African-American and therefore disidentify? And there's a related question. Let me just add this one and let you respond, uh, Pablo, from Reagan Gillum, who uh, is, is asking a similar question, but is asking, is it more complex than just rejecting just rejecting being mistaken for African American? Might there be multiple positionalities at play at any given moment? It seems like you were getting at this when you mentioned the civil rights movement and the young lords. So could you help us kind of, there seems to be some tension between the possibility of anti-Blackness and the promise of, of coalition building. So thank you so much for these questions. Um, I'm so grateful for the questions because I they certainly, you know, it's, Yes, 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 and yes, right? So one thing, the way, um, you know, I've, I've defined race in the project um, beyond the kind of like, you know, Howard Wynett or Michael Omi definition of social construct, right? But I'm also thinking about race within the, the structures of power, right? Um, and thinking about race as one that is also interpolated, right? So like, um, so Garifuna folks never get to be marked as indigenous, right? Because their phenotype, right? Um, their racialization as black people, as people of African descent is one that is experienced in Central America as well as one experienced in the United States. What the video clip really always highlights for me and I write about this in particular because it is absolutely anti-blackness, right? And in fact, is actually um, anti-African-Americanness, right? So this is where it's actually really fascinating to kind of think through, um, and, and this is why I think that even the conversation around Afro-Latinidad is an interesting one, right? Because I think um, Afro-Latinidad being this kind of um, 
reactionary impulse, right, to the erasure and negation of Black people within Latinx communities, um, it is also one that really Garifuna folks reject. And I always sit so uncomfortably with that rejection, right? Because even in this image, um, Dr. Levy, we have here, right? This image, you know, this image conjures so much, well, what is it about Blackness that's not enough for me? Right? And I've asked these questions to my interlocutors. What is it about Blackness that isn't something that you want to immediately check off? Like, what would it mean for you to check off Black and check off Native American? Like, what disruptions would you have there? And I think there is, a, there is an undercurrent of anti-Blackness, right? Um, and I would say there's also an undercurrent of also african Americanness, right? And always ascribing Black to being African-American and having older Garifuna generations tell younger Garifuna generations to not be Black, right? To not lose Garifuna culture, their tradition, beliefs, and customs to African-American culture. And I think um, folks like Janelle Martinez, Aurelio, Aurelio, Arnold Martinez um, are also modeling to us, well, what does it mean when that generation is also pushing back on anti-Blackness, right? The impulse of anti-Blackness that's really clear um, and very visible um, for the older generation, right? I also think this is something that comes up a lot in the scholarship produced on Black immigrants in the US, right? You know, Jemima Pierre writes beautifully on the, you know, on the anti-Blackness uh, of how Black immigrants negotiate their Blackness in the company of African-Americans, right? And I'm always finding, this is why I turn to HBCUs as, as this possible side of, well, what does it mean for, Black Latinx immigrants or the, the descendants of Black, Black Latinx immigrants to negotiate their Blackness in the company of, right? And what does it mean to also undo centuries and generations of anti-Blackness that um, has also been embedded in the culture, right? That is also, you know, one thing about the shipwreck slave narrative, right? Yeah, there are moments where Garifuna folks are using shipwreck slave narrative as entirely divorcing themselves from the histories of plantation life in the, U in, in the Americas, right? And it's actually, and I've seen it done in activist spaces to create a distance with other Black communities that are descendants of plantation life in the Americas, right? So there is this kind of of thread of anti-Blackness that I'm constantly trying to grapple with and, and, and kind of also figure out where's the rupture, right? Where is the moment that the anti-Blackness gets called out and dismantled and there's a reimagining of Garifunaness that doesn't depend on hierarchies, right, of Blackness based on culture, right? Because one of the elder concerns is like, well, folks are losing their culture, right, to African-American culture, well, that's also because Black immigrants also come with this idea, the, the ideas, right, the pathologies, right, that have been constructed intellectually around African American um, culture and peoples, right. So, you know, the narrative of U.S. Black folks are being lazy, or all of these these uh, sociological constructs and, and pathologies that um, are enacted in U.S. society. Black immigrants engage with those, right, and use their ethnicity um, as cultural narratives of distancing themselves from African Americans. And Jamima, once again, Jamima Pierre writes beautifully on this. And I'm I'm building, I'm building in that conversation, but I'm also hopeful um, that Garifuna folks, particularly U.S. born Garifuna folks, right, um, who find themselves in the rejection of their Latinidad and in, in their affirmation of their blackness with other black diaspora communities that there is this building that's happening that isn't grounded on anti-blackness that's that's terrific let me let me turn from from race to two other big categories um indigeneity and the nation uh, there is one question that asks can you speak about the influence and development of arawak culture and language uh in garifuna communities um and i maybe i want to expand that a little bit. Can you also say a little bit more about how your work maybe also helps us theorize indigeneity itself as a big category? Because what, one of the things that seems striking to me is that mobility is built into Garifuna identity from the very beginning. Like that's that's the idea of, of being in motion, which seems um, 
uh, much closer to say Pacific Islander ideas of navigation than um, uh, attachments to certain kinds of land. So I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about that. Um, the other question about the nation is, does your research show any, does, does Garifuna identity follow nation states? The, uh, for example, uh, Nicaraguan, uh, Belize, and Honduran, is that, does, that, does that national alliance, are they kind of track in, in the community building that you're seeing? Yeah. Thank you for that. Give me one second, because there's a there's a really fascinating question that from uh, Dr. Gillum that I don't want to let go, but it's also one of those like I want to screenshot because I want to come back to it and I want to like think some process it more. So I'm going to shoot her email about this because I really appreciate the question and I don't know if there's a way to kind of like save questions in the Zoom world. Um, and if there is, please save these questions because I'm I'm incredibly grateful for them. They're really which is really pushing the project forward and helping me think through some things that I'm still kind of stuck on. Um, and I wanna, you know, there's something about, you know, one thing that I'm also trying to, to, to think about within the context of Black Central America is also the work of like, You know, Black Central America is like any any other corner of Blackness in the Americas, right? It's rich, it's multiple, it's nuanced, it's all of these things, right? And I think in particular, Black Central America's Caribbean coast um, grapples in the afterlife of Spanish and British colonialism, right? So there, there are histories of Creole and Garifuna conflict based on their colonial right? They're, they're colonial markers of language, right? So Creole folks are um, English-speaking Black Central Americans who were colonized by the British. Garifuna folks, their last colonizer was Spanish. So all Garifuna folks are marked with a Spanish last name. All Creole folks are marked with an English last name, right? So that actually really, that distinction is really clear in everyday life in Black Central America. The reason I bring that up is because the generation of the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, which I wanna pay more attention to, particularly because I'm really looking for the moments of Garifuna folks in larger political movements that are led by African-Americans and West Indian Caribbean folks in New York, is that there is beyond the idea of Garifuna folks just being interpolated and racialized as African-American until they open their mouths, right? Is also this idea of well, what, what exactly is the project of Blackness that the Garifuna folks are engaging with, right? And this is where the notion of indigeneity comes in. And I think indigeneity really complicates it, right? Um, and I want, to, I, I want to deeply think about, well, what does it mean for Garifuna folks to engage their indigeneity, their Blackness simultaneously without compartmentalizing, without giving up their culture, right? but can still be in aligned, right? Aligned to blackness in the US, aligned to blackness in Brazil, aligned to blackness in Panama and the rest of the Caribbean, right? And I think sometimes what really, what's hard to also articulate too is also the reality that um, white supremacy continues to be, right, uh, the pillar of how anti-Blackness continues to have a presence, right? So I say that to say is that Garifuna folks get branded by UNESCO a decade ago or a, a little bit over a decade ago um, as, as a masterpiece of intangible humanity. Well, that creates a lot of, a lot of ego, right? This creates a lot of exceptionalism. This creates also this kind of like, we told you, we special, right? And it actually translates to how Garifuna folks mobilize with other Black and Indigenous communities, right? So this is, again, this is where the shipwreck narrative really shapes how Garifuna folks negotiate their Blackness in the company of other Black communities. Now, there, there have been very clear moments where Garifuna New Yorkers 
are have aligned themselves with African Americans, have aligned themselves with West Indian Caribbeans um, strategically, right? To, to build better schools, to build community development. Um, there was this entire movement in Brooklyn, in particular around the West Indian Day Parade. This is why Garif and the folks are really present in, in the West Indian Labor Day Parade, right? Um, Garif and the folks were present in the, nego in the organiza organization of that space, right? Um, but they did, that, they did that strategically in order to be visible, right? In order to be visible in the Caribbean New York community, right? And I, I, I love that question about, um, you know, there's so much, there's so much about not simply passing as African American, and I'm actually not interested in in that moment of passing. What I'm more interested in is the moment after the passing, right? And how folks are um, either aligned, aligning their blackness to other formations and manifestations and regulations of blackness, but also thinking about um, what does it also mean to keep my blackness intact, right? And how Garifuna folks are negotiating that is, I think in really interesting, but potentially problematic ways, right? Of centering a certain kind of exceptional politics around black indigeneity. Um, now my work, this is where the work around indigeneity gets a little tricky. And I, I do wanna talk a little bit about the Carib Arawak aspect because that's actually the, the aspect that a lot of scholars tend to be really kind of honed into. So in fact, a lot of Garifuna work rarely comes out of Black studies, right? So there aren't a lot of folks in Black studies doing work on Garifuna folks. Um, Garifuna folks, a lot of Garifuna scholarship comes out of anthropology. Um, and I think one of the reasons it comes out of anthropology is because of, of this conundrum around Black indigeneity and people really focused on the indigeneity part. Indigeneity, you know, to build on one of the critiques of my, one of my dissertation committee members, indigeneity kind of falls out in my work, right? Indigeneity kind, kind of just slips out, right? Um, particularly because indigeneity is one that has to be performed, right? Indigeneity is one that has to be invoked. And also indigeneity has to be marked, right? That in fact, that indigeneity, the marking of Garifuna indigeneity is one that is dependent on the response of the nation state, right? So when, when we think about Garifuna history in Central America, all of the political organizations are Black. They're Black identified political organizations. So in the 1960s in Honduras, the first Garifuna political organization, Organización Fraternal Negra de Honduras, right? It's not Negra Indígena, it's not Indio Negro, right? It's Organización Fraternal de Honduras, right? So what does that mean in terms of it's the 60s and Garifuna folks are literally organizing themselves under an, or a nonprofit organization that's called a black, a black fraternal organization of Honduras, right? No one's talking about indigeneity in the 60s, right? Garifuna folks are certainly, especially because of the civil rights movement, are using an articulation of blackness to mark their space, right? To mark their civil rights activism in Honduras, right? And this is a time where by the 60s in Honduras, especially the late 60s, we, there's, there's already a trans-circular migration, right? From, from Central America's Caribbean coast to the US, right? So folks have been exposed to MLK, right? Um, there is a Martin Luther King society in Honduras, right? This is folks, Garifuna folks and Creole folks who worked in the US as United Fruit Company US ports, right? Um, and bring that history, bring that, that civil rights knowledge into Honduras. So I think a lot about um, how indigeneity at times really falls out, right? And I'm, and this is also why, you know, the work of like even Ted Gordon, Juliet Hooker, Charles Hale are really helping me to think through, well, how do we complicate indigeneity in the company of blackness, right? And Tiffany King, in fact, um, the Black Shoals has been, if there's a book, it is Tiffany King's book, right? To think about the ed edgelessness of slavery and colonialism and specifically slavery and genocide in the Americas, we, we, we land in the same playing field, right? We land into the same groundings, right? And I, I'm, I'm hopeful that Garifuna groundings around indigenous blackness can give us more uh, nuanced uh, understandings of other formations, right? 
This is wonderful. Let me let me ask one last round of questions. I know you've been very generous with your time, and I know it's late for you. But just let's, let's ask one uh, final set, and then we, I yeah. think we'll uh, we'll wrap this up. So um, one the the final set of questions is really about form of organizing. Um, one question is about how you spoke about the the complexity of spiritual labor, the intimacy of spiritual labor. Can that transform conventional categories of political activism? Um, uh, Danny Hoffman, uh, our colleague here, has asked a similar question about this form of, of, of organizing. Can you say a little bit more about the role of performance? And especially he asks about the role of Black uh, um, queer performance studies. He, he says, one of the powers of E. Patrick Johnson's Black queer performance studies is reading of the body and the unspoken everyday movement. Could you say a little bit more about how that tradition informs your research? And, and perhaps also just how sexuality itself is also an important uh, side of, um, of inquiry for you. Yes, absolutely. So, um, you know, thinking on, you know, thinking especially on the legacies of E. Patrick Johnson, um, Jasmine, Jasmine Johnson, as well as a, a Black performance theorist that I turn a lot to, um, I really, in terms of performance, um, you know, I turn to, to Daphne Brooks' idea of bodies, of Black bodies, Black women's bodies, um, certainly as sonic archives, but also thinking about Daphne Brooks' notions of bodies and descent, and, and really kind of wanting to think about um, how do Garifuna women's bodies also disrupt the space and also allows for other forms of knowledge production to be present. So one of the reasons that I turn to performance a lot is to think about um, the body as an archive, to think about how the bar, the, the movement of the body, the, the, the dancing, the speaking, um, really allows for a certain conjuring around um, ancestral memory as knowledge production, particularly because when, when I think about the ritualization, Right, so the ritualization of Garifuna Settlement Day. I think a lot about the work of M. Jackie Alexander in that sense, right? That the sacredness of the body, the sacredness of the flesh, right? To, to also allow for things that are not easily explained, right? So there's things that are not easily explained and, and they shouldn't be easily explained. Um, and folks, folks should have access to what is being explained. Folks should not have access to what's being explained. So I, I, I I'm also doing a dance in terms of my analysis around uh, Garifuna Settlement Day as an ancestral, right, as an ancestral expression of memory that's embodied in the flesh, right, that it's reenacted, right, that the body becomes the ritualized archive for that reenactment to occur. Um, and I think a lot around, you know, the publicness of it, right? And I think the publicness negotiates a couple of things. I think the publicness of Garifuna Settlement Day negotiates kind of these politics around Garifuna exceptionalism, the politics of ancestral arrival, uh, the politics of well, Garifuna culture um, has survived way before since 1797. How do we, you know, once again, UNESCO brand this and build on the capital of like UNESCO branding. But I also think a lot about um, the intimacies that happened in those public spaces, right? The intimacy around language, the intimacy about spirit possession, uh, the intimacy also around the queering of even the space, right? So um, all Garifuna drummers are men, right? And uh, many of the Garifuna Settlement Day events that are led by LGBTQ folks, there's a gender flip in that space, right? So women um, who identify as as lesbians um, will be drumming as well as I've, you know, have been writing around how grief and the trans women um, become the dancers, then become the mediums in which uh, the ancestral memory becomes present through their bodies. Um, I think a lot about the work of even Black Atlantic religious scholars, right? So thinking about uh, Roberto Strongman and his work around the transcorporality of Haitian voodoo, right? Um, and borrowing from that idea of what, wanting to look at the body as a ritualized archive. And, as, and how does that ritualized archive also uh, can and will disrupt gender and sexuality? And one of the things about 
uh, sexuality in the project is that um, there's a chapter in particular around the queerness of Garifuna dance companies, right? And that the majority of Garifuna dance companies in New York um, have been founded and led by LGBTQ Garifuna folks and how they become spaces of subaltern geographies for queer Garifuna folks, right? A space where they become these underground uh, safe havens, right? These underground homes away from home where one's garifuna and one's queerness can be present without of the threat of the, the continued heteropatriarchy of the matrilineal culture, right? So like matrilineal culture doesn't doesn't abolish homophobia, doesn't abolish transphobia. Um, in fact, matrilineal uh, societies also uphold very heteronorm heteronormative patriarchy. Um, so these, these Garifuna dance companies become uh, subaltern geographies of, 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 of protection, right? Of preservation, of protection, of safeness, right? Um, and very having a lot of interlocutors also connect these spaces to like their own ballrooms, right? Their own spaces of survival um, where their queerness and garifunas uh, can meet. So hopefully I was able to answer this all. That was terrific. Thank you so much, Dr. Lopez Oro. This has been a wonderful event, a wonderful conversation, and I and I truly hope that this is the first of many uh, conversations that we can have with you. Um, I want to thank you, and I want to thank all the folks who were able to participate this evening. So, um, thanks so much. Thank you. Okay. Good night. Good night, everyone.